Welcome back everyone. Do we remember what Newton's three laws of motion are? We noted last time that Newton's third law naturally holds the conservation of motion. So let's find that connection together. Newton's first law will be a great starting point. When there are no external forces applied to a body, then there's nothing to change the motion of that body, right? This is the same as a body that has zero acceleration. Acceleration being the measure in the change of velocity. So if that's zero, that must mean the velocity is unchanging or constant. When the net force is zero, then that means there's no change in motion, which means motion is being conserved. We refer to this as the conservation of momentum. And this is true no matter what. Momentum is always conserved. Need to visualize momentum conservation? No worries, I got your back, minus the cat. Grab two tennis balls. Place one on the floor and one in your hand. Now, the ball on the floor is not moving, so its momentum is conserved, right? Well, what if I try to hit it with the second ball? Look what happens. Ball one starts rolling after it is disturbed, and ball two rolls a bit slower than before it hit ball one. You see, when one ball strikes another, Newton's second law implies that the force exerted on the second ball will change its momentum. Newton's third law tells us that the second ball will exert an equal and opposite force back onto the first ball that initially hit it. This means that the first ball momentum changes by precisely the same amount as the second ball's momentum just in the opposite direction. If you combine the total momentum of each ball together, you will find that the net change in momentum is zero. When this happens, the net momentum is conserved. We've actually already talked a little bit about the conservation of angular momentum. It's precisely what binds our planets to orbit the sun. Recall that angular momentum is generated by a body that's moving in circular motion. The rotating motion generates a twisting force that we call torque. When the net force or net torque is zero, then angular momentum is conserved. The planets need no fuel to orbit the sun, so long as their angular momentum does not change with time. Angular momentum is defined as the mass of the planet times the velocity of the planet times the radius of its orbit. This implies a relationship between the speed of the orbiting body and the size of its orbit. Indeed, we see that the Earth's orbital speed increases when it gets closer to the Sun, but the speed of the Earth will decrease as it moves away from the Sun. All of the planets do this. The conservation of angular momentum is the reasoning behind Kepler's second law. If you want to test out what we just discussed about the conservation of angular momentum and also Kepler's second law, then just dance like a ballerina. When you change the positions of your arms like this, you are changing the size of your own orbit while you spin. You should notice you briefly feel like you spin up when you pull your arms to your body. And if you're looking for a bigger challenge, then grab a swivel chair and perform the same experiment. To notice it even more, do it while you're holding dumbbells in your hand. What is energy? Where does it come from and where does it go? In essence, energy is what makes matter move. And we like to categorize the types of energy based on how matter is moving. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Falling rocks, orbiting planets, dancing ballerinas are all examples of matter that have kinetic energy. And then there's radiative energy, which is synonymous to the word radiation. Radiation is the energy that light carries, and this can also be used to change the motion of other objects. Remember that the energy of light makes it possible for us to see. It warms our planet, and plants use it to live. And then there's energy that is stored, or potential energy. Potential energy can be converted later into energy that moves an object. Yes, that means that potential energy can be converted later into kinetic energy. A rock that's sitting on a cliff has some amount of potential energy. If that rock starts to fall off the cliff, its potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy and is now driving the rock to fall. The most common type of potential energy in astronomy is the potential energy by gravity or gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy depends on the mass of a moving body and how far it can move as a result of gravity. 
For example, it may come as a shock, but stars are not born as perfect shining balls of gas. They start their life as gas and dust particles that are loosely bound to each other by gravity as a cloud. Something violent may disturb this cloud, causing the particles to flow towards the center of mass. And the more mass there is, the more gravitational potential energy there is. So the more that these particles will start falling in a swirling ballet. As the cloud condenses from the infalling matter, the particles start moving even faster, decreasing the gravitational potential energy of the star. The energy ultimately is converted into thermal energy, or heat which makes the star's center hot as it continues to condense into a compact ball of gas, which eventually will lead to an almost perfectly shining ball of gas that we call a star. And even energy is conserved. In fact, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. For example, the radiative energy from the sun's light is generated from the interaction of atoms in the center of the sun. And even before Isaac Newton published his three laws of motion and derived the law of gravity, we were already getting a glimpse into this new world of physics, thanks to Johannes Kepler. Do we remember this guy? Kepler established three planetary laws of motion purely based on observations of the planets in the night sky. What was it that he told us? I realized that to make the predictions agree with the observations, the planets had to follow elliptical orbits, not circular ones. Ellipses are just ovals, sort of squashed up circles, and have two central points called foci. In my heliocentric model, the Sun sits on one of these foci while the planets orbit around it. And there you have it. Kepler's first law is that all of the planets will travel around the Sun in elliptical paths. But then there was something else that Kepler noticed. The planets weren't traveling at a constant speed. In fact, they were speeding up as they approached the sun and then slowing down as they moved away from it. What's up with that? To sound smart, here is how he phrased it. Hmm. Planets cover equal areas in equal time intervals. Yeah, that sounds cool. And that, my friends, is Kepler's second law which turns out to also describe the conservation of angular momentum. But there's number two without three, so what else did Kepler observe? Ah, uh, yes. It seems that planets revolve around the sun at different speeds. Let me make sense of it. It takes Mars almost 1.8 times longer to go around the sun than the Earth. Uh, I have also observed Mars to have a distance from the Sun to be one and a half times the distance of Earth from the Sun. And let's see, Jupiter takes 12 times longer than Earth to orbit the Sun and is 5.2 times farther away from the Sun. I realize that there is a relationship between the distance of the planet from the sun and how long it takes to orbit the sun. So, my third law is the empirical relationship between the orbital period of a planet and its distance from the sun. You see, thanks to Tycho's observations and my math skills, now I know how planets move. But, why are these laws true? Hmm? No idea! Jordan, help us! No worries, Kepler. It wasn't until Isaac Newton came along almost a hundred years later that we finally understood why Kepler's laws were true, particularly Kepler's third law, which turned out to be incomplete. Kepler's third law, which points out this relationship between the orbital period and the distance from the sun, is now known to be the law of gravity. Isaac Newton was the one who sat down and really spent the time to find the complete relationship. The universal law of gravitation describes how gravity behaves and can be summarized in the following three ways. Every body is attracted to another body through the force of gravity. The strength of the gravitational force is directly proportional to the product of the masses. And the strength of the gravitational force is inversely proportional to the square of the distances between the masses. 
Altogether, all of these traits are embodied in the mathematical equation for the law of gravity. We see how the law of gravity depends on the masses of the bodies and how the distance squared between the masses will impact the force itself. That means the farther two bodies are from each other, the weaker their gravitational force is on one another. And the closer they are, the stronger the gravitational force is. This is precisely why the planets revolve around the sun at different speeds. So I know that was a lot to unpack, so let's recap. We described how Newton's three laws of motion naturally hold the conservation of motion, which encompasses all of the conservation laws that hold throughout the universe. And Newton was ultimately able to develop his laws of motion and the law of gravitation and appreciate their implications thanks to Johannes Kepler, who had used completely empirical observations of the planets in the night sky to build the initial relationships. Next time we will start to dip our toes into the most exciting parts of modern astronomy, the study of light or spectroscopy. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button below if you enjoyed this content and to check out our other playlists to learn more about astronomy from the experts themselves. Let us know in the comments below what sort of questions or comments you have and see you next time.